All right. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, if you are tuning in, I see we have some people filing in. So just go ahead and comment in the um, comment section, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook um, or uh, X, I guess we're calling it now. Is that right? Uh, I don't call it that. <laughs> I think we're live there as well. Although the restream icon is still a bird. So yeah, mm. um, you know, we're all coming around with all this. Uh, anyway, so yeah, let us know you're watching. Say hi, um, where you're watching from. All that we're here for our GoWP Experts live stream today with Joe Casabona. Um, he is our podcasting and automations expert. So if you came here with any questions today um, for Joe, podcast related, automations related, anything like that, go ahead and you can um, throw that in the chat as well. And we may not answer that immediately, but we will take note of it and we'll answer it at some point during uh, this live stream. So yeah, to get started, I would just wanna say a few quick words about GoWP in case anyone watching isn't familiar with us. Uh, at GoWP, we say that we create happiness for digital agencies and help them to become more profitable. So whether you're looking to grow your team with a developer, copywriter, designer, or virtual assistant, um, or you're interested in outsourcing services like maintenance, uh, co uh, content edits, things like that, your, your care plan, so you can focus on growth and get yourself out of the weeds, we have got you covered. Uh, we've also built the digital agency owners community, an active community of more than 2,000 agency owners, uh, where we are live streaming this right now, and we do lots of other fun stuff in there. Uh, so if you haven't joined that Facebook group, I'd love for you to head on over and join, and I'll put the link in the comments right after I'm done talking. Um, and if you're interested or have questions about partnering with GoWP to help you grow your agency, um, feel free to reach out, please. My name is uh, Emily, email emily at gowp.com. You can go to gowp.com and reach out to us there, and we'd love to have that conversation. Um, so yeah, today we are here with Joe Casabona. He is our uh, know-it-all on, on podcast and, and automation. He's really got all of the information. I, I think if you've ever been on one of our happiness hour calls with him, or on one of these past live streams, um, you've you've seen it in action, so you know what we're talking about. Um, so I'm going to hand it on over to Joe. Thanks so much, Emily. Don't let my family hear you call me a know it all for any reason. <laughs> I meant it in the best in the best of. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, no, they'll be like, Joe doesn't need that kind of inflation of his. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. It's been a while. It's been like a wild summer. For me, we went to like Bethany Beach and then Lake George, uh, and it was fun and very exhausting. Um, and then I just got home yesterday from a mastermind uh, with a bunch of friends in Scranton, where I graduated. I was very happy that Wonderful. they chose that location. So it was very nice. Nice. That's great. It's nice. Yeah, it feels like summer's kind of, you know, it feels like it or it is. Either way, it is winding, yeah. winding down, school starting back up, all of that. So, so yeah, it's everybody getting back getting back to work these days it sounds good that you had some nice vacation time yes yes so but i am excited to talk about uh pod, podcast production process podcast workflows so uh, i will uh open up my screen here share my screen uh i do want to check great okay cool so uh i trust that everybody could see this uh page and that it's fairly legible and uh, it is facing the right direction. I turned mirroring off because I was mirroring in another place. So uh, if there are any issues, let me know. Um, sadly, with like th the way this works, I can only see my browser window. So I think Emily might have to like yell at me. Um, but if, if everything looks good, great. Uh, so I about two or three months ago, I started this website called Podcast Workflows because I wanted to do deep dives into how other people were producing their podcast. Uh, and this was an educational exercise for me because when you do something for a long time, uh, it could you could get complacent in it, uh, which stifles growth and innovation. So, and I don't want I want my podcast to keep growing, um, but it also helps me give other perspectives to my clients, students, and potential clients and students for what's possible. Right. I don't want everybody thinking that the only type of podcast possible is a interview show where you interview people who are like you. Um, so I started this website uh, for that reason. Uh, you can check out the articles and sign up for the newsletter over at podcastworkflows.com. Uh, and I thought today that I would talk about each of these a little bit to highlight something that they're doing that's really interesting. 
uh, and then mention how it's affected my podcast production process. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions along the way, uh, feel free to ask them and, I, and I'll answer them uh, in in little chunks uh, where, you know, we're not getting that um, repeating effect on the screen. That's like nauseating to me. Uh, OK, so the first one I did was a podcast called uh, Trailer Park. They talk about podcast trailers. Uh, so a little meta, but I, I chose this one. Because Arielle Nissenblatt uh, is a, a well-known person in the podcasting space. She is super dedicated to podcasts, which is why she started this show. Um, and so the big takeaways for me and for the readers here uh, are this is a really niche podcast, right? It's not a podcast on how to podcast. It's not a, a podcast on how to grow your podcast. It's a podcast specifically about podcast trailers and so the takeaway here is is your niche uh you can almost never go too narrow right um i mean never is a word i try to avoid but if you think it's too niche it's it's probably not um and so it takes them about 10 hours to produce one episode it's it's ariel and tim viegas uh who is her co-host and they'll these are maybe 10 or 15 minute episodes uh, and, and they play the full trailer, which is usually two to three minutes. And then they do a breakdown on it. What was really interesting about this is they hit 10,000 downloads in, in six months. Um, and that's a lot, uh, especially for a really niche podcast. Um, but that's a lot for any podcaster. And so I, my focus on this breakdown was what did they do? How did they get to that point? Right. And one of the things they did was uh, direct outreach a lot, right? So I knew about this show before it launched because Ariel was on my newsletter, uh, on my mailing list, and reached out and mentioned it, asked if I could talk about it in my newsletter or on my podcast. And um, Ariel's built this network of podcasters and podcast adjacent folks. And when the show came out, uh, or right before the show came out, she made sure to tell everybody she possibly knew about it. So um, I think the the big takeaway from this and how it can affect your podcast process and my podcast process is uh, tweeting or zeeting, well, you know, whatever it's called now, posting on social media is not a great strategy to drive traffic to your own sites and projects direct outreach is still the best way, right? So they do the social media thing. This is how um, Ariel built up her following by posting interesting things on social media uh, and build that social capital, right? So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's not the best way to drive traffic to your thing. So um, social media shares are fine, but they're not a growth strategy. Identify other people that align with your show's mission and ask them to share, right? And so again, if we're putting this in the podcast process, you can do this pre-launch or if you're post-launch like me for almost all of my shows, um, then you can uh, maybe pick an interesting episode, maybe like a Nexus episode that's coming up and share and say, hey, I have this episode coming out. I think it's gonna be really good. Uh, I'd love if you could share it with your audience. And if you do a weekly podcast, maybe, Pick one a month and identify people who focus kind of closely on that episode, right? So, like, I had Tim Stoddart on the show a few weeks ago. Uh, he is the the folk owner of Copy Blogger now, and he just kind of told his his story. And I usually don't do that sort of thing. I really like the actionable advice stuff, and he gave plenty of that. But I thought that that might be a good you know, doing direct outreach to people who have followed the story of Copy Blogger, right? They were a big name in the WordPress space for a long time. And obviously, Brian Clark is still well known in the WordPress space. But um, that might be a slightly different audience from this week's guest, which is Deidre Shen, uh, who's the founder of Cap Show, an AI repurposing tool for podcasters. So identify good audiences for whatever you want to promote, whether it's the show or a specific episode, 
and do direct outreach. Um, and again, you can do that pre-launch or you can do it um, on a per episode basis. Uh, this is Christina Nicholson. She's the media maven. She's got a, she has an agency that helps you get earned media, uh, which is you're not paying for it. Um, it. It's usually, you know, news outlets that want to have you on because you're an expert. And so she does pitching and helps people pitch better. I, her process has slightly changed from the time I wrote this, but I really liked this because there's a couple of things that you could take away from the workflow. Um, one is that it's okay to change your format and experiment with different formats. Uh, Christina started her show as an interview show, like most people who started like pre-lore in 2014. Uh, I think she started before that. Oh, no, she started 2018. So just kidding. Uh, we can ignore what I just said there. Um, it's just, that is a common format, though. So, um, gosh, she's been around a long time. Uh, and I really thought her podcast was, I mean, I guess it's like seven or five, six years at this point. Um, anyway, it started off as an interview show. Then she started to sprinkle in solo shows. She had a mini series called Three Things on Thursday. And now the show is is just her doing advice about 15 minutes or so. Um, feels very like blog post repurposed, but delivered really well. I, sh I should say the top, the subject matter feels that way. The, the episode doesn't just feel like she is blankly reading um, a, a blog post. Um, and what she was doing for a while, because she was experimenting with YouTube, was recording these episodes as YouTube videos editing them as YouTube videos and then releasing the podcast audio, which means that it only takes her about 30 minutes to produce one episode. She picks the topic. She outlines it. The topic is in her niche. So she's an already an expert on it. She doesn't need to do a lot of deep research. She's pulling from her own experience. Um, and then she does something that I also do, which is during the recordings interviews or not, She'll make timestamps that need editing. Uh, and then she ships that off to her editor. He cleans it up, cuts out the parts she tells him to cut out. He adds like some whiz bang sound effects. Uh, and then it's ready to publish, which she does herself every week. So um, the, the big takeaway here is you want to, um, you need to know, or I, know what you need to get before you go into an interviewer episode. And so this is going to make editing easier. If you're going to do a solo show, don't just turn on the mic and talk. You're like, oh, I'll figure it out. Uh, if you're going into an interview, make sure you, you make sure you at least know the, the thesis statement of the episode, right? Don't just you know, like people try to emulate Joe Rogan because his podcast is like the most popular podcast ever. Um, and he doesn't do this. He does something that's, I think, equally interesting, whether you like him or not, which is he'll run through questions until there's a thing that comes up that he's interested in. And then he digs deep on that topic. That works for Joe Rogan. That will not work for most other people. Almost any other person, right? Maybe Tim Ferriss does that too. Uh, but Tim Ferriss is not nearly as big as Joe Rogan, even if he's relatively bigger than us. So... Um, know what you are going to get, know how you're going to deliver value to your listener more quickly. The way you do that is pre-record. If it's a solo show, find a blog post or a social post that you wrote on it or an email that you wrote on it already so that you have at least a baseline. If you haven't written anything on this already, outline. Uh, I interviewed a guy named Josh Burnoff, um, and he talks about when you write a book, you don't just start with a blank page. You start with a fat outline. So this is not just the headlines or the topics, but it's little blurbs, maybe links to case studies. Uh, it's almost like uh, the way I picture a fat outline is like uh, um, one of those like marble notebooks with like post-its and bookmarks sticking out of it, right? You, you kind of want something like that for each episode. It doesn't need to be nearly as in-depth, but if you're going to talk about, um, you know, how to automate your guest onboarding process, that's not going to be the only thing on, on your outline. It's going to be like, how does it look now? Why would you want to automate it? What are some tools you want to automate? That way you have these prompts and you know what the listener is getting out of it. So 
Um, I think that's the biggest takeaway from Christina's and that's, that's really working for her. You know, she's, she's a well-known person, but I, I think that as she experiments, she wouldn't keep doing something if she saw a decrease in her downloads. So um, I don't know what's going on right here. Uh, this must be like a big image that's slow to load. Um, so, you know, experiment with your, your format, know the goals of the episodes. And then she uses her podcast for lead gen. That's like a, a, a drum I beat all the time. Uh, so I'll just take a quick, uh, wow. Fat outline or <laughs> Matt Medeiros coming in with the hard hitting questions as usual. Shouldn't, aren't you someplace right now, Matt? Aren't you, you're not like at a podcast movement or WordCamp US. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would say it is a thick outline that is also cool. So it's both fat and fat. Uh, okay. Don't worry, yours is coming up. Is that why you're here? Yours is coming up. Um, Jay Klaus was one of the most in-depth uh, breakdowns I did. Um, and his is so different, which is why I took a big swing and said he's taking the Walt Disney approach to his podcast, uh, which he said he's never been compared to Walt Disney before. And I think that's someone, something everybody deserves at some point in their life. Um, so the reason I call him that is because he's doing what, if he's not the first, he is one of the earliest to take a YouTube uh, uh, first approach to his show. So I'll quickly explain what he does, and then I'll talk about how we can, what we can learn from that. He essentially has two editors for his show, an audio and like an audio engineer and then a video editor. He records everything for video first to the point that he um, they spend a lot of time on the first 90 seconds of the video because they know how important that is for YouTube. But they also want to be able to pop that off uh, and make it its own standalone clip that they can share on social media. So it's it's almost like a cold open and a trailer for the episode all in one. Uh, and they edit for that. Um, so he'll do that. He'll send his video to his editor. They'll work on it a little bit. And then they will pull the audio out of... I'm sorry, my New York accent, accent just came out there for a minute. They'll pull the audio out of the video, process that, prep it for dynamic ads, and then upload that to their host and then they'll upload the YouTube video to YouTube. The other thing they do is slightly modify that video for upload to Spotify because they don't have ad breaks on YouTube, but Spotify has Megaphone integrated. And so the dynamic ads that make it to his podcast can also make it into the video. So he's actually essentially creating three versions of the same podcast. Um, so what is So what is he... How is he doing this? First of all, he's investing in it. I think that's one of the reasons that I refer to him as uh, Walt Disney, because I did ask him uh, for video. The juice is not worth the squeeze right now. Uh, the bet is that the juice will be worth the squeeze eventually. Uh, it reminds me a lot of how Walt insisted um, as soon as like Technicolor technology came out he insisted that all of their animated work be in color. Uh, and when he got pushed back from, from animators and other stakeholders in the company saying, why no one has a color TV yet, he said, eventually they will, and we're going to have to go back and colorize everything. So he made a bet that people will have color TVs, and then they wouldn't have to go back later and, and recolor everything. They did it. They front loaded the cost, right? Uh, so Jay's doing a similar bet. Oh, I tell that very, very story here. Um, Flowers and Trees, 1932, when they debuted Technicolor. Um, so he does this because it gives him unique storytelling opportunities as well. And this is something that probably we're going to hit on a few times from here on out. Um, think about how you can improve the storytelling in your podcast. 
uh, here by leveraging new technologies? Does video give you an avenue to tell the story a different way than audio only? If you're doing YouTube videos, does taking that YouTube video and turning it into a podcast episode, does that give you a new way to leverage storytelling? I think we need to be very mindful of the story that we want to tell, which goes back to Christina doing her outlines, why I'm recommending an outline, because you want to tell a story. You, you want to weave a narrative. You don't just want to throw a bunch of facts close, uh, coldly at your listener, right? That's not going to... Um, that's not going to cut it for most people. Uh, so there's a lot here. I would recommend that you really check this one out. It's good. But um, as far as the process goes, think about how important video is to you. Full disclosure, I'm not doing video first. I don't think for me in the way I'm telling these stories. And I mean, budget is, is uh, there's a budgetary um, factor to it as well. I don't think that my podcast would be most effective if I did it video first. My video approach is very different uh, than, um, than Jay's. And the way that Jay approaches his interviews, um, he's changed a little bit to make them video first. So I, I just do the static image on YouTube, which I have a lot of reasons why I think that that's also good to do. Um, but if you think... You know, if you think that maybe your show is getting stale, maybe you want to revitalize uh, the show a little bit. Maybe consider doing a YouTube, like a YouTube approach to it if you want to do that. Um, so top takeaways. Um, experiment with promo swaps. I think this was another really big takeaway from this show. Um, or from, yeah, from me doing a deep dive on this show. Uh, Jay is part of the HubSpot network. And he has seen growth since joining the network. And one of the things that um, you need to, uh, one of the things that you have to do as part of the HubSpot network is leave at least one ad spot for another show on the network. And so you get this network effect, right? You get a bunch of shows on the network, each promoting each other, getting them in front of their unique audiences. I'm not saying you need to uh, join a network, but what I recommend is making your own little mini network, right? Talk to some other podcasters in your space, uh, maybe three, four or five, and see if they're interested in kind of doing a rotating swap with them, right? Because then you're capturing other people's audiences. It's very mutual effecty uh, and you're not going through the rig rigmarole of, of, moving from indie podcaster to um, network podcaster. So I think that was probably my favorite takeaway from that breakdown is um, kind of make your own pseudo podcast network. Did I switch properly? There we go. Good. Um, because that can really, that can amplify the signal of your show. Um, and I, I cover that down here. So uh, this was like, massive 3000 words so i'm not going through the whole thing um really good i thought it was really good so uh his show not the not the breakdown but the breakdown too um the next one i did was justin jackson's i'm not going to spend too much time on this um but i will say my big focus the story i'm trying to tell here is the importance of the of building in public and the branded podcast right they started a podcast called Build Your SaaS that started out as them building Transistor, right? Justin Jackson and John Buddha um, were the host and co-host, as well as the founders of Transistor.fm, uh, which is a podcast host. They're the ones that I currently host with. Um, so they wanted to uh, uh, chronicle their journey, which is cool, right? Because I say it here. When we see the Olympic gold medalist or the World Cup winning soccer team or football team, um, we don't see all of the work. We see how elite they are, but we don't see the work. We see the glory, right? When Aaron Judge hits a home run, 
we don't see that he actually hired his own hitting coach. I'll I got to leave it there. Otherwise, I'm going to go on a rant about the Yankees. But he hired his own hitting coach to help him. Uh, and so it was really cool seeing the um, a company that was like a little bit aware of that and building a podcast where they were building in public. Um, now, since the company launched, they've been doing more interviews with other founders, right? And I like that they pivoted here because they could have just shut it down, marked it complete. Hey, we did our thing. We're great. Um, but there are a few benefits to this approach, right? One is a little research is needed. You're talking about what you're doing and you're talking about things you're already researching. So that's, if you want to have a podcast and you're not sure, you don't want to create more work for yourself, talk about work you're already doing. This is going to help you establish expertise in that field as well. Um, they streamlined the post-production and show notes. We can kind of skip over that. Um, you can read it there. But uh, I want to talk about this because they also invented a new revenue stream for themselves. They decided, hey, we'll just throw a membership on here. I think it was Patreon. Um, we'll just throw a membership on here if people like what, what they're doing. And so at, at one point, you know, they were making 400 bucks a month talking about how they were building their company. So they were, you know, that's, I mean, if if it's 400 a month times 12, I should be able to do that math, right? We're looking at 4,800 bucks. I definitely should have been able to do that math. Um, you're looking at 40, like an extra 5,000 bucks a year, an extra 4,500 after fees or whatever. That's when you're early stage, especially, right? Like if you're not like, if you're bootstrapped and you're not, taking VC money or whatever, that can go a long way. So it's cool that they were building in public, documenting their journey, and they turned it into a revenue stream. And then this also allowed them to repurpose, take that content and turn it into blog posts and tweets uh, and video clips and a newsletter. So don't underestimate the power of that either. Um, you can get a dozen or so pieces of content from uh, a podcast, maybe dozens, right? If you're taking several different clips. So again, relating this back to podcast process, um, this is going to reduce the amount of research you need to do. Even if you already have a show right now, your show is probably in a niche that's somehow, hopefully somehow related to what you do. Try a couple of solo episodes where you talk about what you're doing. And see how that goes for you. Okay, so this one's my favorite. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, you know what? Actually, I'm going to save this one, right? Uh, and I'm going to go to breaking down the breakdown first because this is another branded podcast. Uh, shout out to Matt, who might might still be here. Maybe he left. Man, post in the chat. The red, the Yankees are terrible. Matt, I know that now. Uh, God, now you got to upset me. I was going to give him a shout out. Thanks for taking the time to do my the interview process with me on this one. Um, now he's just smack talking. Red Sox aren't making it either to the playoffs. They're like, uh, you know, we're just hanging out at the bottom of the AL East. Anyway, thanks, Matt. Triggered now. Um. No, this was a real this was really fun because this is relatively new. And so we in the same vein as as Build Your Sash, right? We get to see this early stage and how it's going and how it's going to evolve. Um it also gave me the opportunity to quote Batman, right? You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Matt has been podcasting for so long. Um <laughs> that he's he's basically tried every format. And so this foray into uh, the break uh, into breakdown. I keep wanting to call it uh, the breakdown. I think it's just called breakdown. Matt, you can correct me on that if you'd like. Um, but uh, it's a branded podcast for Gravity Forms. And the format's really interesting because I think the takeaways here are no matter how many downloads you get, um, it's an integral part of your overall content strategy, right? When they do a podcast episode it's three segments right it's kind of what's going on uh, in gravity forms what 
uh, updates are rolling out, things coming down the pike. And then they have an interview with someone from the community. And so, and how they're using gravity forms. So this is great, right? Because you're getting like the press release, you're getting the build in public stuff, and you're getting a case study. So if you're a brand, you've got three segments that you can turn into long form blog posts. And case studies are huge, right? And and people, the community members who come on the show are happy to talk about what they're doing, right? Because they're going on a, a podcast that's going to amplify them. And then Gravity Forms is getting actual use cases. So um, the, I think this is really good. And, and I want to say, you know, Matt, Matt believes it's really important for Gravity Forms and other brands to have this podcast because it does it does these three things, right? It raises brand awareness, it creates long form content, and it aids in retention and helps people stay on Gravity uh, Gravity Forms content longer. So I kind of break down all of this, but um, you know, long form content retains users. It's not it's not as ephemeral as say TikTok or Twitter uh, or Instagram Reels, and so. I really like I really like this. I want to take a moment to drive home the point that even if you're a company or a brand, uh, having a podcast could be um, integral to your content strategy. Even if it doesn't get a lot of downloads, it is creating a lot of content sawdust, if you will. And the, the I think the as far as the process goes. Uh, Early days are experimental. When I spoke to Matt, he was trying some, you know, he, they were trying a bunch of things. They were maybe bringing in a new editor uh, to talk up to um, help move the story along with audio cues and clues. Um, and so taking the opportunity to experiment, especially early days, uh, can really shape your show and grow your show. Uh, be open to experiments. So that is Breakdown with Matt Madero. So if you have any specific questions, you can ask Matt. Matt might have left now that I made fun of him. Um, and, and the Red Sox. Um, but I, I I check, I mean, I would also say like check out, check out all these shows, but check out Breakdown, right? This is a WordPress-centric uh, podcast. And so really interesting what they're doing over there. Uh, and then the last... Uh, the last uh, public breakdown I've done, I'm working on my next one, is History Daily. This was like a massive 3,500 words. Um, and I spent a lot of time here because I think this show does a lot of things right. And yes, it is distributed by Wondery, which is owned by Amazon. Yes, it is uh, in partnership with Noiser uh, and Airship, which is uh, Lind the host, Lindsey Graham, not that Lindsey Graham. Um, that's his audio production company. So they've got a lot of manpower behind it, but it really, I think, is a, a great example of a lot of things going well. So first of all, um, I start this blog post with a story. Uh, so I'm going to try to do it in the style of, of Lindsey Graham, right? Because this is, this is kind of what he does. Uh, it's a typical Thursday morning, and six-year-old Teresa is in the car on her way to school when her father turns on a new podcast. Her father is always listening to boring podcasts. But this one's different. It tells a harrowing tale of two men racing to the North Pole for the first time without modern technology. Teresa is hooked. She hangs on every word, reserving any questions she has until the end so that she doesn't miss a second. The next day she listens too, and the day after that. In fact, she doesn't miss an episode. The show is called History Daily. It's an important part of Teresa's morning routine, and it begins to shape the way she perceives audio content on April 6th, 2023. This is how Lindsey Graham starts all of these episodes. It is a daily history pod. It's a This Day in History podcast. This is something that he could coldly deliver as a page a day podcast, right? He could say, hey, everybody, it is August 22nd, and uh, on this day in 1962, the then French president, Charles de Gaulle, uh, survived an assassination attempt. 
That's super boring, though, right? So he does a lot of things right here. He and his team do a lot of things right. This is deeply researched. I want to dive into the storytelling part because it is the heart of this. He gets a 15-minute episode out of a single event, and it's because he does a lot of things really well here. Each episode opens with an in-depth description of a character who is often named and always related to the historical event. In the execution of Thomas More, it was Thomas More himself. He was the main character in the story. But in an episode called The Deadliest Day of Northern Ireland's Troubles, the main character was an innocent bystander who was in Ireland during the Troubles. Um, and then these stories are also told in present tense, right? So it's it's putting us there now. Um, and he does this because it gives us an emotional connection to the story, which means we want to keep listening. So that's the cold open. He creates a character we can relate to. Uh, the initial character creates some sort of tension, and he opens a curiosity loop. Um He's also filling out the details of the world around us, right? So, like, he talks about in one episode a disgusting smell that drifts to the main character's nostrils, right? Um, the stench is horrendous. You're built, you're weaving a story there. This is something that feels harder in a not in a non narrative podcast, I guess I'll say, right? Like, it doesn't feel like you can do this with an interview. Or a solo episode where you're teaching something, but you can, right? And so the other thing, and this is obvious from their transcripts, is it's a three-act podcast, right? If you look at the three, the three-act framework of a story, right? You've got um the beginning, right, where it introduces the character. We've got a conflict, um, and that's also an act one. We have the rising action. And the climax in Act 2. And then in Act 3, we have... Not in this case, but we have an ending of some sort that closes all of the loops at the end. So as you think about how to structure a podcast that you want to be interesting for people, um, think about that three-act story, right? This is deeply researched. Obviously, they're finding people who may not be obvious um, mention worth mentions in the story but he's obviously doing something right history daily was number 11 at the time i took this screenshot in the history podcasts american history tellers and american scandal are also lindsey graham's podcasts so thinking about that i think is really helpful that's this is maybe the thing that's affected um oh matt's still here thanks matt um this is the thing that I think has affected my process the most. I've been thinking about how to incorporate storytelling more into my interviews. And so something I've been trying lately is instead of just generating a questions doc for me and my guest, I generate a document with three headlines, act one, act two, and act three. And that's how I want to frame the interview. The way I'm doing it this way is because, or the reason I'm doing it this way um, and my next breakdown is going to be about uh, my friend Yang Su Chung's podcast, First Class Founders. Um, but he essentially has a producer for his show that sits down with the guest and elicits all of the answers, like sound clips, like sound clip style. So Yang Su is not necessarily having the conversation. Someone else is getting the answers for him. He'll come in at the end. Uh, from what I understand, I'm actually recording with him right after this uh, in like 20 minutes. So um, uh, I guess subscribe to my newsletter to find out. Um, but from what I understand, like his producer asks a bunch of questions to get the recording, the recorded answers. And then Yang Su comes in at the end and has a conversation. And then they build a story, right? I don't want, first of all, I want to produce, I want to produce my own podcast. I don't edit, but I want to produce it. Um, and I personally don't have the bandwidth budget or time wise to do something like that so i'm trying to do it on the front end so i sit down with the guest i give them the proposed act i frame it as here we're going to introduce you 
And we're going to introduce the thesis of our story, right? We're going to create an inciting incident. Act two is going to be all about the conflict. So how do we raise the tension of what we're talking about in act two? And uh, I interviewed my friend um, Kathleen uh, Salmons, and she is a LinkedIn expert. So our act one was something to the effect of, why should I be on LinkedIn, right? You're you're opening a question with, well, like, is LinkedIn even a social network? And then she says, yeah, this this immediately creates a little bit of um, a little bit of intention, a little bit of an inciting incident, um, because we're starting at the axiom of I don't need to be on on LinkedIn, and she's telling us why. The actual conflict in Act Two is when I ask, how do I increase my followers? Because then she immediately responds with, if you're just trying to get followers on LinkedIn, you're doing it wrong. So now we have a conflict, but then what she says is in conflict with what most people do on most social media. Um, and then in act three, we finish with how, if, if not followers, then what, right? Our climax is don't try to get followers on LinkedIn because it's about relationships. Act three is how do we nurture those relationships? This creates a nice story arc that's easier to follow. I'm not just throwing questions at my guests. And more importantly, we work together to tell the story because they're the subject matter expert. And I'm the one who's trying to tell their story. Uh, they're the hero. I'm the guide in this situation. So that's all from History Daily, which is why I wanted to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and I think th those... If I want to look, I'll look at the screen again, uh, just so I can kind of recap what I've talked about here. Um, if we're looking overall at our process, right, we want to think about the story we want to tell at the beginning, have a clear outline of what we're going to talk about, what our listeners are going to get, and the story that we're going to tell. We're going to, uh, for most of us here watching this, um, we're going to want to pick something that we are subject matter experts in, maybe build in public, definitely build our expertise and create not just a great piece of content, but what could be an asset for lots of pieces of content. And then to get more people listening, we want to cultivate a network like Ariel did uh, and do direct outreach to people who would genuinely benefit from this content. So, those are the things that you want to keep in mind as you build your own podcast process. Uh, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. So uh, I haven't seen any questions come in. I'll go to, I think I'm streaming on my YouTube channel too. So hopefully I'm not ignoring my chat. Um, oh, it's all coming in, which is great. Um, so uh, happy to take questions. Also happy to just chit chat. The, the last one I have here, uh, if there are no questions, uh, is everything that goes into making a daily podcast. This was some experiment. Uh, this was some content I was experimenting with because I took a bunch of trips and I didn't have time to do the like the the more deeply researched stuff that I've been doing. And so I I this was it wasn't shorter, but it was less research intensive because it's almost like the solo episode. Um, I'm very familiar with the process already. And so, you know, everything that goes into making a daily podcast, I listen to a lot of daily podcasts. I produce a podcast, a bunch of podcasts, and one of them is going to be daily. Um, so I wanted to kind of touch on different types of daily podcasts and how you might make that work, even if you are a busy solopreneur with kids like myself. Uh, so I can certainly talk about that um, if there are um, no burning questions. Um, I haven't seen any come in, Emily. I don't know if, if there's another place where I'm not. I don't know if like Facebook uh, or, you know what, LinkedIn, I don't think comes in. So um, let me double check that there are no questions on LinkedIn. Sorry if you're watching on LinkedIn and I ignored you. Um, cool. Just reactions, no questions. All right, cool. So um, I will spend the last bit of time here uh, talking about uh, what goes into a daily podcast, why you might want one and um, how you can make it work 
even if you are a busy person. So um, the first thing I do here in this article is define a daily podcast because I think some people have questions around that. Is it literally every day? Uh, some are. Um, I think the Daily Dad is every day. Um, or the Daily Stoic is every day. Maybe the Daily Dad takes Sundays off. Uh, that Yeah, that's what I said here. Um, those are both Ryan Holiday podcasts. And they're mostly solos, but they, they have some episodes. History Daily and The Bulwark uh, are both Monday through Friday. Uh, History Daily does do a podcast swap on Saturdays, which I think is really interesting. They call it the Saturday matinee, and they highlight a different podcast, different history podcast. Uh, but Graham still follows the tell the story sort of thing, which I think is really cool. Um, so for all intents and purposes, I'm going to say a daily podcast runs Monday through Friday. Take the weekends off. Um, there are several different formats to the shows I cover here. Uh, the Daily Stoic is usually less than eight minutes, but they have a long episode on Wednesdays. So there are actually two episodes on Wednesdays, the Daily Tip and the full interview. The Daily Dad is less than five minutes usually. Actually, it's really like less than three, but the ad is like two minutes. It's wild. Um, and that's very like daily affirmations like hey parenting is hard you're doing a great job um or hey you know a messy house is a lived house right if you're worried about having a messy house with kids um don't because it means that they're having fun um and then they do a longer saturday episode i think lately he's been doing conversational ones with his wife um i just think it's always funny that it's like ryan holiday and wife whatever i don't remember her name um, but it's always like uh, she always she always gets the prefix title of of wife, which I think is funny. Um, but both of those shows offer like tips and words of encouragement. History Daily we talked about a lot. The Bulwark is a daily news podcast. Um, so it's host Charlie Sykes, rotating cast of co-hosts. Um, and so while the other shows I've talked about here, like History Daily, definitely batches the Daily Dad and the Daily Stoic, definitely batch. Uh, the Bulwark doesn't and can't really because um, this is much closer to a radio show and they're talking about current events in near real time. You know, they'll say things like uh, we're patiently awaiting. We think the fourth indictment of Donald Trump is coming out today. And like, so they have a time they have to record. Um, and there might be news that they want to cover but it hasn't happened yet. So they can't really batch these like weeks in advance. Um, so that's something that you want to consider for a daily podcast. Uh, pick the topic of the show and your schedule. In Charlie Sykes case, the bulwark is pretty much his full-time job. And so he spends a large portion of the day already commenting on current events. His show makes sense. Um, but Lindsey Graham is doing other stuff. Ryan Holiday surely is doing other stuff. Um, and those shows don't rely on the current events. Uh, so if you're going to do this and you're not in the news field, right, where this is your full-time job, I would say pick a short solo format where you can record several episodes at a time. I used to send a twice-weekly podcast tips email. I don't send that sequence anymore because it's not necessarily directly aligned with what my newsletter offers now, but that's all really good content. And you better believe I'm going to repurpose that content as the daily episodes for, um, for the podcast workflows podcast, which is coming back. So um, you want to pick something that you know well and works for you. Um, and if you're going to create the daily podcast, you need at least one of these, like a deep, you need to be deeply passionate about the topic or you need to be an expert in that topic. And I'm saying that because you're going to be doing this every day, right? There's, there's going to be days where you don't have the energy. And so that passion is going to drive you or you being an expert means that you might be able to phone it in sometimes if I'm being honest with you. Um, and like, why shouldn't we think about that? Right. Terry Gross talked about that, right? She was the longtime host a fresh air. She's a veteran in the field and we're very well respected. Um, and she has talked about how sometimes she'll just zone out 
while a guest is talking and how she's recovered from that. So we're not always going to be at the top of our game, but if it's something we're deeply passionate about or an expert about, we can still perform at a good level, even if we're not at the top of our game. So um, you want to make sure that you pick a topic that works really well for you. Um, that can also, I, you know, I always include like be a research resource for you and your business. Um, when it comes to doing a daily podcast, I would say like write down your emails as, or your ideas as quickly as possible, capture them, look at all of the content you've done before and see what you can repurpose and chunk into shorter episodes. Uh, and then consider either scripting or outlining history daily is definitely scripted. It has to be, um, holidays is probably scripted. Um, I'm saying probably with 99.5% certainty. I just have never asked him, right? I've never heard if it's scripted or not. Um, but it's almost definitely scripted. The The way he delivers, um, I'd be pretty confident in saying like, I could probably go grab my copy of the Daily Stoic and find the corresponding episode and they're going to be very similar. Um, the bulwark is definitely not. But they still have an outline because there's a, a bunch of prep work. Sykes decides what topics they're go that they're going to go through and lets the guests know ahead of time, hey, we're probably going to talk about these things unless something just completely blows up the episode, right? Which is possible in a news program. But you want the guest to be prepared. You don't want to just say, all right, uh, so, um, you know, Iran just pulled out of the nuclear deal. What does that mean for us? And the guest's not like an uh, expert on Iran or nuclear, 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 nuclear deals. So um, I really think that I, I outline a good sequence of events here. I think short scripts will probably really benefit a daily podcast, uh, especially a shorter one. Then and here's the coup de gras, right? Uh, you want to batch these episodes. I'm batching them. I try to record like seven to 10 in a row. They're short and punchy. And then when I have like 40, I'll be able to uh, maybe 40 or 50. I'll be able to release those because now I have nearly two months of content. Um, I guess Monday through Friday, that's 20, 40 episodes is two months. Right. Um, so that's something else to consider. Um, I also kind of break down how, daily show like daily podcasts are monetized ads membership obviously um if you want to look at a bunch of different good monetizations monetization strategies check out history daily they do a really good job so um the big takeaways here i think are if you want to start a daily podcast don't release before you start batching a bunch of episodes pick a topic you're really passionate about and see what content you can repurpose um and that's all i've got I hope I hope that this was good for you. I'm always uh, you know I'm always worried if questions uh, don't come in. I was either really thorough or uh, I haven't enough to elicit good questions. So. I think it was thorough, Joe. I I enjoyed listening to it. I liked the breakdown of all the the different podcasts out there that are doing these pretty impressive things. Um, but yeah, we did not get any questions, and so if you have questions and you're still watching, send those in. Um, Joe, where can people access that amazing content that you that you put together? That is over at podcastworkflows.com. All right. I'll um, put that in the comments. Yeah. So, yeah, they're all public, so you can view those if you want them delivered to your inbox, usually on Sundays. Um, you, there's an opt-in there. You'll be able to sign up. Awesome. Let me get in here. There we go. And I'll put that over on... Facebook as well, because Restream makes me have to comment on both places because it won't send it to Facebook. But I'll, ah. I'll get that over there as well. Um, yeah. they, the, the comments come in, so I'll see if people if people chat in, but I can't send out from Restream. Awesome. Um, but that was great. I loved everything you said about storytelling. I think that's so um, just on point for, for this kind of thing. It, gives, it, it at least gives people some guidance on how to craft a podcast, right? It doesn't yeah. just have to be an interview format. I know we've talked about that on past um, past live streams we've done with you, um, and that that unless you're you know Joe Rogan or Tim Ferriss, it's not always the most engaging format for for a podcast. 
Yeah, you know, I think it's it's like, um, and I mean, like, you know, Conan needs a friend, right? Like, I mean, he has the podcast too. I think you look at traditional interviews and it feels so natural and fluid and unprepared. And that just that just tells me that a ton of preparation went into it. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, it's like you watch a movie and the hallmark of a good movie is you don't realize you're you're watching a movie like it feels real. And that's not because they didn't rehearse. It's because they they rehearsed a lot, mm-hmm. a lot. and edited and edited yeah and got you know you you think about barbara walters interview she didn't get her her interviewees crying in 45 minutes you know the interview is much longer than that right (laughs) yeah and what we saw was was the the good stuff yeah and then the storytelling yeah and then they weave that story together together yeah right it's um yeah so there's a lot of work that goes into all of that to make it look like it was easy Uh uh-huh and and it's and to make it easy listening. Yeah. Right. So that, that's the key there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Joe, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us live and, and is watching right now and watched throughout. And thank you to folks who are watching the, the replay of this um, after the fact. And if you have questions, go ahead and post them. Uh, you can join us in the, the go to EP digital agency owners, Facebook group, and you can post questions in there and we'll definitely see those. Um, and we'd love to, to have you in that group as well. And, and go check out podcastworkflows.com where you can, uh, get all of the, the great content that Joe was going through today. Um, there he is. And Jay Casabona on Twitter. On every, X. Uh, Twitter, <laughs> on <everything>. X, Instagram, <laughs> threads, all, all the there places. There we go. Ooh, threads. Yeah. I still yeah. am yet to, I need to check that out. I haven't yet. I like it. You know, it you doesn't like it? feel, yeah, it feels, it feels more like a town square than a bazaar where people are barking at you that you should yeah, wake up at 5 nice. a.m. and not shower, right? Okay. That's there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, Joe, thank you so much. We will be back with you again next month. So make sure um, you sign up to our newsletter, um, sign up for Joe's newsletter. It's fantastic. And um, we'll see you back here next month for more podcasting and automation tips and, and insights. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.